Great. Yeah. Thanks so much for, for having me here today. And thanks all of you for, for attending. Um, I'm going to discuss a little bit about a recent paper that I was, that I worked on um, in collaboration with Adobe um, and Queen Mary. I was doing an internship at Adobe and I'm just going to drop the link to the archive so you can check it out um, there, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, see if I can make sure I get it right and that we get the audio as well. Uh, let's see. Okay, you see my slides okay? Great. Yeah, uh, so um, as you said, my name is Christian Steinmetz and uh, I'm a PhD student going into my third year at Queen Mary University of London. There I work with Josh Rice in a group kind of focused on AI and uh, audio engineering. And the work I wanna talk about today is titled Style Transfer of Audio Effects with Differentiable Signal Processing. And as I mentioned, this was kind of a collaboration as part of an internship with Adobe, along with my other collaborator, um, Nick Bryan. Um, and so I'm going to try to keep the talk to around 30 minutes to kind of give you the biggest insights. Um, and hopefully that'll give us a lot of time for discussion um, and, top, and kind of further topics um, related to that that I, that I hope we can discuss about. Um, so the major motivation for um, this work is the reality that uh, kind of now more than ever, there are more people creating audio content kind of across all different kinds of domains, whether that's in the context of music um, or in the context of um, podcasts and kind of like those are kind of like audio focused um, applications, but there's also huge growth, right? in things like short form content on TikTok um, and sound for long form video and things like YouTube, where audio quality is kind of just as important as visual quality um, in order to kind of get a high quality um, uh, production, right? And uh, as a result, there's this demand for high quality audio um, as well. And like I said, this could be in things like speech or music or, or more. But traditionally, in order to get high quality sound, you would need an entire recording studio and a bunch of expensive equipment um, to, cap to kind of capture this along with things like uh, condenser microphones. But what's amazing now is that there, a lot of this technology has been distilled uh, kind of into anyone's laptop computer with kind of very powerful DSP tools and digital audio workstations that when paired with even kind of relatively affordable um, consumer hardware like condenser USB microphones, the kind of capture side of recording has become a lot more accessible um, than ever before. But the problem is that uh, the, like the creating a quality production doesn't end at the capture phase. And so you also kind of have all of this complexity of, you know, all of these uh, amazing uh, plugins that are at your disposal in a DAW, as well as, you know, kind of if you're dealing with multi-channel content and you have this added complexity of handling individual channels and how to um, address them. And you may have, you know, all these different types of tools and DAWs that each have their own ways of operating and working. Um, and as a reality, uh, as a result of this, the reality is that uh, producing high quality audio requires a lot of expertise still these days, even though kind of the tools have become more accessible overall. And that motivates the specific task that we investigate in this paper that we kind of call style transfer of audio effects. And the idea here is that we want to be able to control some complex chain of signal processing uh, devices uh, using a, a very simplistic method in which the user doesn't have to understand anything about those underlying uh, signal processors. So for example, we might have some user that makes a recording on their mobile device. And as reference, they have some other recording that they have from, let's say, their favorite podcaster, if this is in the podcast context. And they want to use this reference recording to uh, make their recording sound as if it was produced in a similar manner. So for example, that could mean things like capturing some particular spectral profile that matches that recording or, or controlling a dynamic range compressor to kind of have a similar um, dynamics. Uh, for example, maybe it's a very compressed recording as is common in a lot of podcasts and speech recordings. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's the basic idea here that we wanna have a system that could kind of automatically um, calibrate some signal processing chain based on these two recordings that a user might supply. And you could even think of a simpler version of this where um, we could have some like set of golden reference recordings, for example, so the user wouldn't even need to provide their own. We could just build a system where we provide these reference recordings um, for them that will drive the system kind of in like a one button manner as well, which would be a really attractive for some of these applications like short form content creation. Uh, 
So I want to give you just a quick demo to start of what the result of our system uh, can do in the context of both speech and in music. So in the first example here, you're going to hear um, some speech that is kind of missing a lot of low end, potentially recorded on you know, a cheap mobile phone. And then you'll hear the style reference recording that is used into the system that has much more produced. And you'll hear then the kind of the final um, output of our system that has uh, predicted which parameters uh, for the EQ in a compressor. The input speech sounds like this. Oh dear, oh dear, I shall be too late. The target style sounds like this. Resided in the populous kennels. The input speech again. Oh dear, oh dear, I shall be too late. And the stylized output. Oh dear, oh dear, I shall be too late. And so in that example, hopefully you could hear that in the kind of output recording, there was a significant amount of bass that was kind of restored in the recording and also a bit of compression that was applied as well to kind of match this kind of produced uh, recording that was used for the style reference. The inputs. Um, and we also trained our system to work on uh, music recordings, kind of in like a mastering setup where we kind of just process the, the output of the mix bus. And so in this example, you'll hear a recording in which there's far too much bass in the input. Um, it's very bassy and the high end is, is lacking. And then we use another song as a style reference that is kind of more balanced. And then you'll hear the result after uh, passing that through the system. The bassy input music sounds like this. The target style sounds like this. The input music again. And the stylized output. Yeah, and so in that example, you should have been able to hear that the system was able to adapt this time to a different problem, um, adding kind of an appropriate level of high frequency boost uh, to this recording um, in a way that didn't require kind of any uh, interaction on the user's part to control or understand those underlying audio effects. So uh, now I want to kind of uh, talk about how we came about to design this uh, system, how it works, um, and overall, like what our findings were um, through this process. And to begin, I think our design of our system was really motivated by this uh, kind of way of thinking about the audio production process as a three-stage process. And uh, you can think of it first that perhaps the audio engineer does something like an acoustic analysis of the input signal when they begin to kind of understand, you know, what is the spectral balance of that signal? What are the dynamics like? And given that, they're then going to kind of do some sort of planning. They're going to establish some acoustic goal, which we could kind of, in this case, we kind of consider that goal to be a style. Um, and that's usually a, a function, a um, complex function of the context. So like, what is the material that they're um, working with? Where is it going to be used? Is it a podcast as an advertisement? Um, is it a rock song or is it a jazz song? All of those things are going to um, imp impact this. Um, and after they've come up with a plan, they're then going to use their knowledge of these signal processing tools like audio effects in order to achieve that goal. And so what we realized is that one of the prohibiting factors in building kind of data-driven approaches for this, this task is the fact that this kind of like planning stage is very subjective and is context dependent. So it's very difficult to kind of model this, all three of these stages kind of implicitly with one um, model. And so using this is kind of what motivates our style transfer task, because by doing, by doing style transfer, we don't have to have the model decide what the style is. Instead, we kind of provide, have the user provide some notion of the style, and then we can focus actually on having the model learn um, just task one and three, for which we can kind of actually generate a lot of training data for in a self-supervised way. And that's what I want to introduce here, which is one of the main uh, contributions of the paper um, around this kind of self-supervised uh, training regime that enables us to learn audio production without any kind of this kind of this kind of style transfer audio production without any kind of labeled um, human uh, data. And so the way this works is we begin with some data set of recordings, and it can be any kind of recordings that don't have to be clean recordings necessarily. And we do some kind of basic augmentations to increase the diversity, like pitch shifting and time stretching. Um, and given that recording that's been augmented, we then create two different views, um, as it's often called, of those recordings by passing them through some chain of DSP. Um, in this case, we looked at EQ and compression, as I mentioned before. And we create two different random configurations of that chain of, the, of its parameters, which will create two different recordings, one that we call denote XI, which is, becomes the input recording, and one that we denote XR, which becomes the reference recording. And so these are the, sa these are the same recording, but have had different effects, or as we call them, styles, applied to those uh, recordings. 
And what we do next is uh, this idea to actually split those recordings in half in time to create two different sections, like a first section and a second section. And that gives us this A and B. And we do that split the same for both the input and the reference recording. And then what's uh, important here is that we then have this kind of uh, shared, uh, uh, shared weight uh, encoder system here, where we're gonna pass both the input and the reference recording into this encoder that's gonna generate some representation um, that we're gonna use to drive the prediction process or parameter prediction process. But what's important is that we pass the A section of the input and we pass only the B section of the reference. So in other words, the idea is if this is a sentence and someone's speaking, the words that are, that are being seen by the reference part of the section of the network is going to be different than what's seen by um, the input side. And the idea here is to try to encourage the model to not just simply uh, collapse to the, to the assumption that the input and the reference are always going to be coming from the same source. Because as we know in the real case, the reference is going to be a totally different recording with different uh, content if it's a speech or different content if it's music as well. And so this is kind of a trick to try to encourage the model to not uh, take advantage of this assumption that they're going to be the same content. Although there obviously are some uh, dependencies in this recording, even, even though we split it in time, but the hope is that training with a diverse enough, ex uh, diverse enough number of recordings, we can kind of get something that's able to generalize to this actual case we care about. And so what happens next uh, is that we then pass this uh, to uh, this uh, controller network here. And the controller network just takes a concatenation of these two uh, embeddings. And what it's then tasked with is predicting, uh, the controller is just some MLP in this case, and it's tasked with predicting some set of control parameters that configure uh, a chain of differentiable audio effects. And then what we can do is feed in this original uh, input uh, recording section A and try to predict an estimate of that uh, re process recording. And since we have actually the original true reference section R of A, we can compute using any kind of loss function, you know, audio loss function that we want and have a ground truth to compute the loss and back propagate um, all the way up to these encoders as well. And so that's kind of the big picture idea of, of what we aimed to do here with this setup. But as I mentioned, the this differentiable audio effects are a key uh, component of, of this uh, method. Um, and in, in, uh, as I mentioned, this enables kind of like zero shot audio production style transfer because the idea is that uh, we can kind of pass any kind of reference uh, recording ideally, and it will be able to try to match that in some, in some sense. Um, but yeah, as I was discussing, the, the differentiable signal processing is a, is a key component of what we're doing here. And this is kind of a generalized uh, diagram of how I think about differentiable signal processing. In, in what we're doing is that we have some general uh, framework where we have a deep neural network that sees as input some audio recording. And there's also some uh, DSP that could be a chain of effects that also gets as input the same recording. And this model is tasked with predicting some set of parameters, p hat, that configure this DSP such that it, we produce some signal y hat that's as close as possible to some target signal that we want, which, which we denote here as y, according to whatever loss function could be you know, mean squared error in the time domain, or it could be STFT domain loss uh, as well. So there's a, a lot of options here. But what we note is that in order to use this kind of loss function to optimize this network, when we don't have the true ground truth parameters, we just have input and output audio, we need to actually uh, backpropagate gradients through this chain of effects. And that requires that we have ways to, to backprop through these DSP operations, which is a non-trivial task. Um, but as a result, there's a lot of reasons why we might want to do this instead of just, for example, replace this with a giant black box neural network to perform the transformation of the audio. And I think one of the biggest ones is that we can leverage a whole range of tools of DSP that audio engineers are already using, like I mentioned, parametric equalizers, compressors, reverbs, and so forth. Um, and we already know that audio engineers on a day-to-day -day basis are using these tools to achieve this goal. So why not use them uh, in this context as well? Um, we also get a big benefit in that we can kind of uh, process audio without as much worry about introducing artifacts as if this, as compared to the case where a neural network is used to kind of process the audio, which is kind of a known challenge of existing uh, neural network approaches. We also get human understandable um, outputs from the controller model, right? This P hat is actually generally some set of parameters like the cutoff frequency of various filters or the ratio or threshold of a compressor. And that means that not only can we see what the, the model is predicting, but the users can actually go in you know, after the fact 
and adjust those parameters if they want to change them slightly, which black box approaches kind of uh, suffer from in that they kind of just give you one answer and you don't have um, an option to adjust it. Um, and finally, uh, a big motivation is also in the context of uh, efficiency. So at, at inference time, we can just run some DSP on the audio, which is much cheaper than running you know, a large neural network across audio at high sample rates. Um, so we can kind of deploy, this is a much higher chance of deploying this successfully in a consumer product um, that could actually be run, for example, on a mobile phone without having to communicate with the server. So, to facilitate uh, differential signal processing, there's actually been a number of different approaches that have been investigated thus far. And by far the most uh, common and well-known approach is to simply leverage existing automatic differentiation frameworks to do this. And what that means uh, more concretely is just that whatever op DSP operations that you have, you simply just explicitly code them up in whatever your favorite auto diff framework is, whether PyTorch, uh, TensorFlow, JAX maybe, and then if you, as long as you can define the operations within inside that framework and they're differentiable, you can use uh, the existing Autodiff uh, library to compute gradients um, explicitly for this signal path and train your network. Um, and this was like kind of popularized in the context of audio with the DDSP paper that I'm sure many of you have, have seen. But the problem is that you have to now re-implement every effect in the context of audio effects that you want inside uh, PyTorch. And this is a non-trivial and kind of difficult task, especially as you get to more complicated effects that might have you know, very difficult um, or complicated signal processing pipelines. Um, and so that's kind of the, the biggest uh, challenge with this approach you have kind of have to take all the DSP knowledge and then I'll re-implement it and fit it into this other system, um, which kind of operates in a fundamentally different way than a lot of audio software is written. So to kind of get around that, one approach that we investigated in, in previous work um, that I did in my master's thesis was a, this concept of using a neural proxy uh, to facilitate backpropagation through effects. And the way that this works is you first have this pre-training stage where what you do is actually try to build a neural network here that emulates the behavior um, of the input output behavior of some audio effect as well, along with its control parameters. So we can kind of generate a data set to train this model by just passing random audio through the, the audio effect and changing the parameters randomly, and then trying to make our neural network produce the same output that the true uh, audio effect uh, produces. And after training that for a sufficient amount of time, the idea is that we can then go back to our differential signal processing framework and then swap in this frozen DSP uh, proxy, which is fully differentiable, fun continuously differentiable function that then can enable us to compute gradients uh, for this deep neural network. But uh, one in, in this in the past work that we did, we didn't even we didn't investigate what happens if you were to take the audio effect and put it back in. Uh, we just used the neural network proxy at inference time. But clearly you could see that there'd be um, a lot of uh, motivation for trying to use the DSP during inference. And so one thing that we investigated in this work that hadn't been looked at before in the context of audio was to uh, first in the training phase, use uh, training phase of the deep neural network, use this neural network proxy. But at inference time, swap back in, as I said, the actual original DSP, since we don't need to compute any gradients at this point, we just need to actually process the audio. And this has the benefit of greater efficiency again, and the fact that you can use the true audio effect. Um, but it was unclear exactly how close the proxy needs to be to the original audio effect in order for this swapping to work. Because you can imagine that now, if there's any kind of difference in the way that the parameter space is being handled by the deep neural network, if something is shifted when we swap these out, we might not get very good performance. So that was something that we investigated for the first time in, in this work. And, and finally, the, the last gradient approximation, or the last approach we looked at was gradient approximation, which was introduced at a recent paper um, from Marco Martinez. And in this work, it's kind of inspired by this idea that you can kind of compute uh, estimates of a derivative, um, as you've probably seen in your basic calc class using something like finite differences, where you do a forward and backwards uh, measurement of some curve, right? And you can use this to estimate the gradient at some point um, along here. And so you can, uh, you can, uh, take the same finite differences and extend it to whatever dimensions you want. In, in this case, it could be the dimensionality of the parameter space of this uh, DSP, but that's can become uh, intractable because now you need to like perturb forward and backward every single parameter independently to get an idea of the gradient. So uh, in this paper, what they proposed was actually to use this SPSA approach. And it's kind of an extension of finite differences in which you perturb all of the, the dimensions of the parameter space uh, at the same time by some small random amounts. 
And it gives you a noisier estimate of the gradient, but requires many fewer computations of the of forward a pass of the, the box in order to understand its gradient. And they were able to demonstrate that this approach could uh, be used to train controller networks for some various tasks. But they hadn't looked at it in the context of uh, controlling multiple effects at the same time or within the context of the style transfer task, which is what we then aim to uh, compare it against these other methods I just discussed. So uh, hopefully all of that uh, has made sense so far and that it makes uh, uh, that my motivation for trying to use these kind of differential approaches is clear. Um, but beyond the kind of neural proxy hybrids that I mentioned that we investigate for the first time, we also needed to set up a chain of auto diff effects that we could use uh, for our comparison in the context of the EQ and the compressor that we're looking at. And so in the context of the parametric EQ, there's already actually been some work in differentiable um, parametric EQs and you kind of exploit this very simple idea um, in, in this work from, uh, uh, from Shahan uh, Narcissian, uh, where you can actually simply approximate the response um, of the IAR filters that make up this parametric Q simply by taking the, uh, the DFT of the numerator and denominator coefficients, and you can pad them, zero pad them by some amount uh, to approximate them across the frequencies range. Uh, and then this will give you some approximation of their uh, of their frequency response, which you can then, if you have multiple second order sections, you can you multiply their responses um, together and use that and apply the I, you can apply an approximation of the IR filter response um, as a frequency domain uh, FIR filter, essentially. And the reason that we want to do this is because it means that we don't have to back propagate through time, which would be the case if we used the explicit like time domain IR function, uh, which is, is recursive. And this uh, provides huge benefits in the context of gradients because we don't want to have to do back propagation through time, especially at high sample rates like 44,100 uh, hertz. We'd have to do that many gradient steps just to compute one. Whereas in the FIR case, uh, we can get a fairly good approximation, but uh, do all of it in parallel on the GPU and not have to worry about the vanishing or exploding gradients in that case. Um, but we kind of ad adapt this exact approach to implement our parametric EQ. But in the case of the compressor, there was not um, any existing implementation of a, of a differentiable compressor that we had seen um, before this work. And we were able to get a lot of the components of the compressor to be differentiable, um, or at least uh, piecewise differentiable uh, at, at, to some degree. But what we struggled with actually was this reality that in the kind of standard uh, compressor, digital compressor design is this branching, uh, 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 detector that happens here when the uh, signal is either crossing the, th the threshold and the attack or release mode needs to be engaged. And there's these two different recursive filters that need to get active, activated at different times based on what the signal previous signal level has been. And basically there's not a very easy way to implement this with the kind of same FIR approximation approach that we were doing. And so to implement uh, kind of a differentiable compressor here, we make a very crude approximation by just restricting this to be a singular uh, to be a singular time constant. So the attack and the release have a shared time constant here, which means that we can use just a single FIR filter to emulate the ballistics here, but we don't get the same kind of expressive nature that a true compressor generally has. But we found that, you know, in the listing examples, we were able to get something that was kind of sufficiently close with this kind of approximate compressor um, that was fully differentiable and, you know, could run in PyTorch. Um, yeah, and so that kind of summarizes all of our, our main approaches here in the method uh, section. So after, you know, we have all of these different uh, approaches for the, the uh, uh, differentiable effects, so we kind of aimed to use this style transfer task as a way to benchmark them. And so we considered all of these different models that I mentioned, um, as well as there's also this difference between a half hybrid and a full hybrid that I won't go into, but it's in the paper if you're interested in learning more about that specific method. But we also considered as baselines kind of a rule-based DSP approach. So kind of a set of steps that we could apply that would try to emulate the style um, by looking specifically at like, what is the spectral balance of this recording? What do what the dynamics look like to try to set it to uh, automatically set a compressor? And we also looked as another baseline at this conditional TCN, which is basically replacing the DSP with a full black box neural network and saying, you can process the audio however it wants to do the style transfer. What kind of things can it, can it achieve? And, and our hope here is that we're able to do achieve like a similarly expressive uh, style transfer without having to use a full neural network and that we can use one of these DSP based approaches. And uh, all of our uh, models are trained using the multi-resolution STFT loss. So 
computing in SDFT with multiple different uh, window sizes. And we train models across both speech with LibreTTS and uh, separate models across music using the MTG to Mendo data set. So we can kind of demonstrate this approach for both, uh, both domains here. And as I mentioned, we consider this kind of fixed setup across all the different approaches of a six band parametric EQ and a single band dynamic range compressor. So now I wanna to get to kind of the, the main results of, of our experiments. And we performed a lot of different experiments to understand how this system was working. The first uh, kind of set of experiments we do consider is what we call synthetic production style transfer, which is the same setup as is for training. So it's where the reference and the input come from the same recording, but they're two different sections of that same recording. But as I mentioned, that's not as useful because it's not going to evaluate what's the real generalization performance um, at test time, which is gonna be when the reference recording comes from a totally different source than the input recording. So we also invested, we designed a method to investigate that. And we also investigate the ability of our encoder to learn representations that are uh, relevant for audio production. So for example, does our encoder capture information about uh, how the EQ and the compressor um, is set in a recording? And finally, we also look at the computational complexity of these different um, approaches experimentally to see uh, what their impact is. So to kind of make this more clear, I wanna show again, this difference between the synthetic and the realistic uh, style transfer case. So as I mentioned in the synthetic case, we have a single recording and then we, from, for example, one speaker, and we spit it, split it into two different recordings, one an input and one a reference, where the reference has some different audio effects applied to it. And then what happens is we pass this to the system and the system makes a prediction to make the input recording sound as if it has the same effects applied as the reference. And then we can, since we know what effects were applied to this section, we can apply those to the same section here. And then we can use any kind of metric that we want um, to compare just their distance in some, in some sense. But as I said, this isn't really realistic. So in the realistic case, what we do is we take two different recordings of two different speakers, for example, that have different effects applied to them. And then what we do is pass them to the system and make some prediction of this uh, particular audio uh, recording uh, to make it sound like this one. But we don't know what the true parameter should be. So what we do is actually use this original reference, but we use some subset of our metrics that capture just high level features of the audio. So they're kind of like uh, metrics that don't require um, a full reference. So the reference here can be, so what we do is compute things like the spectral centroid or the like kind of average spectrum of those signals and compare them, which doesn't, it means that the signals don't have to line up uh, exactly in order to get a notion of how similar they are. Uh, it's still somewhat of a crude way to, to see their similarity, but it's a more realistic case because now the model actually has to generalize to recordings that are kind of different from what it saw during the training process. So as I mentioned, we consider a number of different metrics as well. Um, for general similarity, we consider both PESC and SDFT, which is the same as the training um, objective here. But we also consider these kind of higher level features that capture just specific aspect, aspects of, um, for example, the EQ. So we look at the Mel spectral distance, which in this case is using a very large window, like over one second uh, window. And we also look at the spectral centroid error um, as well to kind of understand how the, the characteristics of the spectrum were captured. We also look at, for dynamics, uh, both the error in the root mean uh, square energy and the difference in perceptual loudness using uh, LUFS to, to uh, measure that. And this kind of gives us a lot of different ways to view um, the performance of the model across these different uh, metrics and tasks. So to talk a little bit about the numbers and the results of this, in the case of the synthetic uh, style transfer task where we can compute all six metrics, um, we saw pretty clearly that the automatic differentiation approach here denoted AD kind of outperformed almost all the other approaches across the, the metrics um, with the exception of the TCNs, which were quite close behind um, the AD um, approaches. And, but what's really interesting to recall here is that the, the TCNs here are full neural networks that are being tasked with the style transfer task and amazingly using the auto diff uh, effects. So an explicit compressor and EQ was able to actually outperform a full neural network in this task of, of transferring the style, which I think is a great um, result. Um, we also see that pretty clearly we um, you know, improve a lot on the input recording, which is like applying no effects um, and also improve upon uh, the rule-based DSP method as well. But when it comes to the other methods, um, 
that I talked about, the neural proxies as well as the gradient approximation, we can see that the SPSA performs uh, better than the rule-based DSP across a lot of these metrics, but uh, still struggles somewhat um, in, in relation to the automatic differentiation method. And that agrees with some of the results that we saw during training and that getting these kind of um, gradient estimates to train a neural network stably is very challenging. And they also kind of, there's some other hyperparameters that you need to tune and how are you doing these forward and backward measurements um, and things like that, like how big is your step size, for example. And all of that uh, can really impact getting that model to converge. And even when we were able to get it to converge, it converged to a worse performance than the auto diff uh, based effects. In the context of the neural proxy effects, what we saw that was interesting was that uh, essentially using those hybrid methods I discussed where we swap back the DSP, which is the half hybrid and full hybrid here, um, across all the metrics except for PESC, essentially performance gets much, much worse when we switch, when we swap the DSP back in compared to using the real uh, proxy. So there's like in the STFT distance case here, lower is better. And there's a pretty uh, big delta when we go back to using that. The same is in the case of male spectral distance, as well as in the, in the case of LUFS. And this really points to what we were seeing is that there even though we were able to somewhat model the original effects with the neural proxies, they weren't close enough that we could swap back the original DSP. Basically, uh, performance of the neural proxies was kind of contingent on using the neural network during inference in order to uh, be able to uh, control the, or to complete the task that we cared about. And I think the reasoning there is that actually the neural networks that we use to do this modeling need to be more expressive in order to capture the full range of all of the things that those effects can do. Because we can build pretty good effect modeling uh, neural networks, but generally only for simple, simplistic effects, like ones that have sh small, uh, short time windows. So something like distortion or EQ, we can do pretty well. But when you extend that to not only be that, but also want effects that um, have large parameter ranges. So like an EQ, even a one band EQ can have all of these different filter shapes, right? And it's very difficult for one neural network to emulate all of those different filter shapes. So I think basically to, the short answer there is that more work is needed to kind of improve um, the neural proxy approaches. But we also investigated um, similarly to other out of domain data sets, both DAPs and VCTK. So speech from totally out of distribution um, or out of domain uh, uh, setups to kind of evaluate whether our system would work in those settings as well. And we found pretty similar performance in that the AD method was still kind of uh, continuing to be pretty, pretty strong, but the uh, TCNs were also um, very competitive uh, in comparison. And I think most importantly, what we saw is that, you know, in the case of PESC, there was like a 0.1 drop um, when switching to the out of domain data set. And similarly for SDFT, it's like maybe a, a little bit less than uh, you know, 0.1 uh, change as well. Um, so basically there was some drop when we changed to uh, data from a different distribution in, in evaluation, but it wasn't that significant uh, perceptually kind of indicating that our method is actually generalizing uh, to some degree to these out of domain uh, results. We, we did all of these same experiments also on music, including out of domain uh, music data sets, um, but I'm not gonna discuss that here because the results kind of show the same story. But I think what's uh, interesting here is how we evaluated this realistic style transfer. And what we do is define some set of five styles as we call them, which are modeled by distributions that we kind of manually handcrafted um, of the parameters of the parametric EQ and the dynamic range compressor. So for example, here are like specific sampled um, parameters um, of those, uh, of these different styles. And so you can see that the EQ, like one of these is like a telephone-like filter where there's a huge boost around 1K. But the idea is that these are not fixed presets. They're actually just distributions. So you can sample random uh, uh, different versions of these styles that will all kind of sound similar, but are distinctly different. And that means that the model can't just, in this case, you know, converge to just always predicting the same parameters, right? It has to actually understand something about these, how these styles are and like this distribution, it's like a latent distribution that we manually handcrafted. And that, that's true for both the EQ and the compressor where they have different levels of compression uh, in the context of the ratio as well as the threshold. And so we kind of generate a data set to evaluate on by taking clean audio and then uh, randomly sampling parameters from these distributions, passing the audio through an EQ and a dynamic range compressor, and then building up a data set um, that's balanced of all of these different um, styles. So like some clean data set, we can create a new data set that has these like five different styles um, that we've kind of handcrafted, but where each style is slightly different parameters each time are used. 
And what we do then is we to evaluate the models, we then do all pairwise like style transfer. So go from the telephone to the warm uh, style, for example, where we take two random recordings, one that's telephone and one that's warm, where the two source material are different speakers, for example. And then we compute these high level metrics that I discuss. And uh, I think really encouragingly, we see that we still outperform the DSP baseline across most metrics in most cases um, by a significant margin. Um, and that the kind of same trend exists from before that the SPSA is somewhat slightly behind uh, the auto diff and that the neural proxies are even further behind in some case worse than the DSP uh, baseline. And again, we did experiments for this on out of domain data from both DAPS and MuseDB in, in the case of music. So I think these res results like were really encouraging. I think uh, 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 are close to what you were hearing in some of those examples I played all the way at the beginning. Um, yeah, and so the kind of last experiment or the main other experiment I wanna discuss about um, is this idea of under trying to understand that uh, to what degree our encoder has learned uh, representations um, that are relevant for audio production. So right now in the in the literature and audio, we're like in, in deep learning, people are really interested in building general purpose audio representations that encode things about like, for example, the class of the item uh, or the thing that's creating a sound, uh, the, the idea about maybe potentially about acoustics of that uh, sound space could also be relevant um, to things like the acoustic scene, uh, like uh, sound events, right, and things like that. But what hasn't been really investigated is do those representations encode information about signal manipulations that audio effects do? For example, the spectral balance of those uh, recordings or the dynamics. And so to investigate that, we take the same data set that I just discussed that we built around style, these kind of predefined styles, and we, we take our frozen pre-trained encoder from before that was trained just for the style transfer task. And we just attach a linear classifier as is common in evaluating self-supervised models. And we treat it as a five-way classification task where now the model is tasked with seeing some random uh, signal that has one of these styles applied and it has to predict which of those styles was applied to that audio. And what we found here is that we could do this, uh, you know, I, here we report the class-wise uh, prediction scores and we use as baseline just a random projection of a ML spectrogram, OpenL3, which is a very common general purpose uh, representation, and CDPAM, which is a more recent um, audio quality, neural audio quality metric. And we use those representations um, as well to compare against representations learned by our model. And what's really interesting is that you see like OpenL3 basically totally fails at this task. Like it cannot um, accurately just predict whether a telephone filter was applied or whether a broadcast filter was applied, for example. But we see that CDPAM actually does much better at this task because it was explicitly trained with um, the notion of EQ and trying to understand those things because they affect sound quality. But what we see is that it totally fails on differentiating like the broadcast and the neutral sound effects or the styles because those incorporate dynamics. So the difference between broadcast and neutral is just that broadcast has a lot more compression applied. And since CDPAM wasn't trained with any dynamics, uh, knowledge of dynamics, it fails at this task. But what we see is that our models, almost all of them excel kind of at, at understanding those differences and differentiating between compressed and not compressed recordings. <coughs> Similarly, we did uh, kind of the same experiment for music. And you can see that performance um, for the other pre-trained models kind of degrades even further. Our model can somewhat, uh, somewhat better uh, capture the performance here but still struggles in the case of music more so than it did in the case of speech. And I think that's because the recordings from USDB already have some effects applied to them. So even when we kind of like create the style data set, it's already somewhat noisy. I think that's why we see these results. But either way, I think we kind of concluded from this that this style transfer task actually was an interesting way to build representations like this that could be useful for other downstream uh, tasks where you want a representation that encodes things about the style of the audio production. And uh, finally, on, on the note of computational complexity, um, there are some also interesting uh, things to talk about here in that the case of like our rule-based DSP runs on CPU quite quickly um, compared to the other methods as we'd expect, because it's just running a, a, an EQ, an FR, uh, the FR filter that's gonna be kind of like a matching filter um, as well as a compressor. But we can see that the CTCN, which are these like big black box neural networks are far heavier uh, to run um, on, uh, on a CPU, um, but on GPU are obviously quite efficient, but that's not as realistic for a, de a deployment case. Um, what we see is that like the neural proxy hybrid methods as well as the SPSA all use the same DSP and inference time, 
So they're able to get a pretty good speed up and like basically as fast as the rule-based DSP. Um, and interestingly, we actually, in the context of training, we actually found that the auto diff method was the fastest to train, um, whereas the other methods uh, took a little bit more time. Um, but all in all, what we're trying to just show here is that there, there is some real benefit to using the DSP at inference, which is kind of our, our main goal. Uh, let's see. And yeah, so just to summarize kind of what I've discussed here as I start to wrap up, is that the rule-based DSP uh, baseline was able to kind of do better than the input signal, but still was outperformed by most of the other learned approaches. Um, the neural proxy approach, hybrid approaches did not work well because of the reasons I discussed before. Um, and there's more future work is needed on, on improving those if we want to go down that pathway. Um, the gradient approximation or SPSA performs about second best overall, but struggles with instability and training and has additional hyperparameters and still doesn't work as well. And automatic differentiation kind of seemed to be the leading approach in the terms of the metrics, as well as our own kind of informal listening. But as I mentioned at the beginning, it really struggles because it's very difficult to easily extend this to kind of work with any effect that uh, an audio engineer might wanna work with, because now you need to re-implement every effect in PyTorch. So I kind of argue that it's not really scalable as we move towards the future um, to building kind of more systems like this. We kind of need some other more unified approach. Um, but yeah, so as I, as I wrap up here again, the, the major contributions of this work and things that I hope you will, the take home messages are, um, our approach here was really the first kind of effect style transfer approach that integrates um, audio effects as differentiable operators explicitly. So we can use an end-to-end -end domain loss. We don't um, compute any error on the parameter space, which is problematic for a number of reasons. Um, we also uh, propose the self-supervised training that lets us learn this controller network without any kind of human labeled data. And as I just discussed, we had this kind of results of this benchmarking of different um, differential signal processing approaches that I think have applications beyond what I discussed here today. Like these could have approaches in any, any type of place where you want to use a neural network to control some sort of DSP. These kinds of insights I think would be generally useful. Um, and as I mentioned, we also kind of had the development of this neural proxy hybrid, which didn't really work, but we investigated it. Um, and also this differential dynamic range compressor approximation that is kind of the first of its kind um, as well. And uh, if you're interested, all of the code for this project is open source on GitHub, you can, as, as well as the pre-trained model, so you can play around with it um, right now. There's also a Hugging, uh, hugging Face uh, Spaces demo of it as well, where you can like upload your own audio files. It's not fully featured at this point, but it has some of the like most basic models that you can play around with there um, and, and see it actually do something, uh, which is really cool. Um, and yeah, and the last thing I want to I leave us with is just some future directions, things that I think would be interesting um, to look at after this work. Um, I think the simplest extension is just to do the same style transfer task, but add in more effects. We kind of, we kind of did the simplest but interesting pipeline of the EQ and the compressor that we thought would work. But you could see that you might want to extend this to be have other effects like reverb and distortion, which we also have some previous work on in the context of differentiable DSP. Um, so you could kind of combine all those together. And now you could imagine doing things like trying to match the guitar tone of one uh, guitar to another using this approach where you're controlling a distortion as well as an EQ and a reverb and all of this stuff. Um, I think another, the other interesting thing you get there is, well, what if we could actually dynamically construct a chain of effects to do this matching as well would be really um, interesting. Um, also adapting this approach for kind of a multi-channel use case particularly in the case of multi-track mixing would also be very interesting. So you could have a notion of like a style mix and your stems of that mix, and you now want to create a mix of that. Um, and also I think the biggest challenge to solve here would be zero shot adaptation to a new set of audio effects. So you train with some audio effects here, but now you want to put this thing inside someone's DAW and they have some, they have their own VSTs. How could you have your system in zero shot or a few shot adapt to those effects to control them kind of as if it had learned about those effects, um, which I think would be really impressive. Um, but yeah, that, that summarizes everything I want to discuss about. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and always available via email to, to answer as well. But thanks so much.